down and said, give me somebody before age seven, I can turn them into anything I want. So that's why there's this push, push, push. Get the kids into the school system. Get them to not follow evidence. Get them to only do as they're told. Get them to be little robots. Get them to think it's normal to march up in lines and act like little soldiers and so forth. And then later in life, they'll never know the difference. Everybody has to get, get rid of the idea that they're an individual. They have to understand that we all have to work in the group for the collective, for the good of the whole. Not for the good of your child or for the good of the teacher, for the good of the whole. If you have to give up some of your most cherished beliefs, and that they have to train you to give these up, because it's going to be for the good of the whole, you give it up. What this legislation does then is to help harness this patriotism and connect deeds to needs. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well-funded. Those who refuse the Soviet influence in their own country would be character assassinated or executed physically come revolution same way as in the small town of Hue in South Vietnam, several thousands of Vietnamese were executed in one night when the city was captured by Viet Cong for only two days. And American CIA could never figure out how could possibly communists know each individual where he lives, where, where to get him, and would be arrested in one night, basically in, in some four hours before dawn, put on a van, taken out of the city limits, and shot. The answer is very simple. Long before communists occupied the city, there was extensive network of informers, local Vietnamese citizens, who knew absolutely everything about people who are instrumental in public opinion, including barbers and taxi drivers. Everyone who was sympathetic to the United States was executed. They've been turning on the American people and working against our interests for a number of years. And the people that you may be seeing that are going to be targeted to be put into these camps, these dissidents, these disenfranchised, disaffected people. The government would never, never, ever turn on the American people. They would never create a situation where they were so displeased with their government that the government may be forced to throw these people in concentration camps. They'd never do that, would they? My name is Sam Ozaki. I'm a native-born American citizen, Los Angeles, California, along with about 120,000 other persons of Japanese ancestry when Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. We were all rounded up like cattle and placed into America's concentration camps. They had designated areas where people would report and they were transported by bus to their, they call them assembly centers. They didn't have facilities to house 120,000 persons, so they took over racetracks, fairgrounds, places like that. Work in the camp was slave labor. In fact, they had us making camouflage nets for the United States Army. Now that was absolutely slave labor later on I said we should all have refused to work and then let the army and the government come in and do all the chores that had to be done but as I said we had lost all our not only our life and liberty but also our finances there were many parents who never even told their children that they had been in concentration camps because they were ashamed we should not be ashamed. It was the United States government that should be totally ashamed of their behavior in putting 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry in America's concentration camps. And you have to be alert because it can happen again. Look at American history between 1942 and 1947. The data that was collected by the Census Bureau was handed over to the FBI and other organizations at the request of uh, President Roosevelt. And that's how the Japanese were rounded up and put into the internment camps. I'm not saying 
that that's what the administration is planning to do, but I am saying the private personal information that was given to the Census Bureau in the 1940s was used against Americans to round them up. I think there is a point when you say enough is enough to government intrusion. And you had mentioned this earlier, 28 pages. I have the survey right here, Glenn. This is the 28-page survey. This is the short form that every American will get next year. Do the, does the federal government really need to know our phone numbers? Do they really need to know, like you said, the date and time that we leave, mental stability? You know the one question that's not on this survey, Glenn? Are you a U.S. citizen? I am just not comfortable with the way this census is being handled, with associating with ACORN, with the questions that are being asked, with Americans being compelled to give this information, how will this be cross-checked? Will it be held privately? It's a five up to a $5,000 fine. They're saying that if somebody who is connected with ACORN, now working for the U.S. Census, shows up at your door, knocks on it, and demands to know your race, your employment status, the name of everybody in your household, whether you've ever received food stamps, and your phone number, and everybody else's phone number, and you say, I'm not really comfortable giving that to you, you're going to get fined 5000 bucks. The United States government, between 1942 and 1947, passed the Second War Powers Act. They used the U.S. Census information to round up the Japanese and put them in the internment camps. Okay. Americans were told that they wouldn't have their information used against them. They did. Census alert. For the first time ever, 2010 census takers will be armed with portable GPS trackers. These trackers will be used to collect the GPS coordinates of every home in the United States. Upon completion, the U.S. government will have a roadmap to every front door in America. Well, one of the things that we're fighting here in Oklahoma City, we have a, a radio show called Radio Free Oklahoma, and we try to get the information out about the uh, upcoming swine flu vaccines. You hear that NORTHCOM is coordinating with FEMA to work for the mandatory vaccinations. There's all the, the legal uh, framework in place through the Patriot Acts and the uh, Emergency Medical Powers Act to, to force these uh, vaccines on people. And then if you deny it, you know, where are you going to go? Well, they say that you can be charged with a felony or put into a quarantine area. Now it's starting to come into view how these camps could be used. Well, today we're in a circumstance where the economic and the political dynamics are pushing America and the whole world into a crisis dynamic. This crisis is being created uh, through the process of sustainable development policy. Several things are, are, are occurring. One is that our system of justice is being changed. We're shifting from equal justice where every human being has certain unalienable rights to life, liberty, and property, etc. To a system of social justice where no one has any such right but where people are judged based upon the group that they're part of. Previously, there have been several reports, such as the Mayak report in the state of Missouri, but this is the first time that a report such as this actually named individuals. Uh, once you label someone uh, in a derogatory manner, uh, an extremist, a potential militia member, terrorist, whatever term is used, uh, for some people, the moniker will remain. Before you can persecute a people, before you can incarcerate large numbers of people, you have to marginalize them. Uh, you have to create the image uh, that these people are dangerous to society or they're extremists or radicals, call them what you will, but marginalize them from the mainstream of society so that at that point, uh, the rest of society will accept the persecution that might result upon this group. It's been an age-old strategy that's worked in every totalitarian regime in the history of the world. And that's why we're concerned here in the United States when we see this kind of marginalization going on about people who voted for Ron Paul or people who voted for Chuck Baldwin. Now, why are they being marginalized? Why uh, are they being singled out as a potential danger to society? And I think it's shades of the strategies and tactics of totalitarian regimes in history past, and that should never happen in this country. The people in Washington, D.C. haven't represented what was on the American people's minds for a long, long time. They are the most disassociated, discombobulated, disconnected people on this planet. 
and they necessarily had to do that for all the violations of the Constitution that they've done. Just how far are you willing to go before you stand up and say no more to the federal government? Our founders actually intended for the federal government to be very small and limited and that most of the uh, service of government was to be done in the states. And so I think there's probably a growing conflict between states and the federal government. And I think there's some really good reason for the federal government to be concerned right now because I think there are a lot of people in the United States that are beginning to say, where are we going to draw the line in the sand and say no more to the federal government? America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedom, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. Abraham Lincoln.